Thank you so much, Dr. Krister Carson, for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. You're welcome. I wanted to start off by just asking you to describe your most recent research. That was uh, actually a hard question because uh, uh, my background is in operations research. Mm -hmm. So I started off uh, with uh, using mathematical methods in uh, solving problems in business. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, that was in the uh, 1970s. And uh, as you know, in this uh, field of ours, information systems, things have changed mm -hmm. dramatically over the last two or three decades. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the present moment, um, the research group I, I, I'm uh, having is doing research on uh, uh, soft computing. Mm -hmm. And I can describe a bit what, what that is about. So uh, soft computing is um, uh, one of the computational intelligence methods, or schools, if you like. Mm -hmm. And in soft computing, we work with imprecision. Mm -hmm. So we work with imprecise data, and uh, we try to uh, still use mathematical mo methods and models, and we try to find uh, solutions to complex and dynamic problems, uh, which. Uh, then also have imprecision, which makes them r really hard mm -hmm. to deal with if you use classical methods. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the re research areas. Uh, it's also known as uh, fuzzy logic, mm -hmm. uh, which we recently renamed to uh, the logic of imprecision. Mm -hmm. Because in English, fuzzy logic means that it's some kind of strange logic. <laughs> and um, the logic of imprecision is an axiomatic logic system and it's very precise. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the strange things in our field that uh, the uh, fuzzy logic, the logic of imprecision is very precise. So when you're working with these complex and dynamic problems, um, can you first describe to us what kinds of problems we're talking about, real world problems that you can apply this research to? Uh, I'm coming from Finland. Mm -hmm. In Finland we have this tradition of cooperation between uh, researchers and industry. Mm -hmm. um, one of the good examples of that is, of course, Nokia. Mm -hmm. That was started in the early 1980s through joint research by universities and uh, the Nokia Corporation. Mm -hmm. And um, when it was um, uh, at its best, it had 40% uh, of the world market of mobile phones. Mm -hmm. So it was um, a very successful technology. I remember that time. Uh, and um, uh, this tradition has continued. Mm -hmm. So we still uh, work with the problems that are addressed by the, the industry. And we use our methods to go there. And we have access to the senior management, to the, the operating management. Mm -hmm. And we have access to the data we need in order to work with uh, our methods on these problems. So this is, um, I think, one of the advantages we have. And um, it's rather common in Europe that uh, mm -hmm. uh, research groups and um, companies work together. Mm -hmm. It's not that common here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I think this is um, one of the differences we have, uh, which, by the way, uh, is quite visible here at the Higgs conference. You can see it uh, even now in the sessions when people present their papers that uh, European papers deal with uh, real life problems mm. in companies, mm. and uh, the US papers uh, uh, address problems which are then tested with uh, students. And um, uh, of course, students are proxies for real decision makers, and that's not really a good solution. Right, so there's this dichotomy between rigor and relevance. So if you are able to test with undergraduates the ideas you have, empirical rigor, um, and then Sometimes it compromises on relevance. So if you had to put yourself on the spectrum, um, where would you place yourself? OK. Uh, that's one of the questions that we have been addressing in soft computing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when we talk about uh, real life problems in industry, mm -hmm. uh, there is a trade off between rigor and relevance. Mm -hmm. So uh, at uh, some stage, when uh, we need to get relevant solutions 
for the decision makers. Mm -hmm. We have to give up on, uh, on uh, rigor. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, when we write things for the journals, uh, we, can, uh, we, we have to present rigorous results if we use mathematical methods. Mm -hmm. And then we introduce a sufficient number of assumptions, mm -hmm. which will then uh, take away a bit of the relevance. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in real life, uh, relevance is uh, most more important than rigor. I see. So more towards relevance, but on a sliding scale, depending on. Uh, your it's actually a continuous scale, yeah. and uh, it's actually a trade-off. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when we work with uh, uh, real uh, real data in uh, real companies, mm -hmm. there's also a cost issue. Mm. So you cannot uh, go on experimenting That's endlessly. True because the cost goes too high. Mm -hmm. So we have this um, notion that uh, uh, we have sufficient rigor, mm -hmm. but uh, we, we have uh, relevant solutions uh, which can be defended mm -hmm. uh, when things go badly <laughs> in the industry. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm wondering, you talked about your research in the corporate context. Can you imagine how your research could be extended beyond uh, that environment, perhaps with government, perhaps with uh, other issues? Now the, the thing is um, uh, that uh, uh, there is, of course, um, in our research groups, mm -hmm. I'm with uh, the Institute for Advanced Management Systems Research, mm -hmm. um, we have this um, situation that um, from time to time we, we simply work out the mathematical solutions mm -hmm. of everything. And um, uh, we, we don't do that in a corporate context. But um, it is one of our traditions. We have been uh, now operating for 23 years mm -hmm. uh, that we always uh, want to go back to the corporate uh, environment to test how our methods work mm -hmm. and uh, if the results that we, we create, if they, they have relevance. I see. So over those 23 years, I'm just wondering if there's a particularly wicked or complex problem that your mathematical model was able to, to help oh, with? Oh, oh. <laughs> these are the war stories. And uh, <laughs> we have had a number of these things. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, OK, one of the, the cases that we uh, recently have been reporting on is uh, something called real options. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, a method used in uh, investment planning. Mm -hmm. uh, the real options. Um, is a way to look into the future. Uh, you have to make assumptions uh, for the future cash flows when mm -hmm. you have uh, you are making decisions on investments mm -hmm. for something like 100 million euros or mm -hmm. a billion euros. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to have a, a scenario for about 10, 15 years ahead okay. and uh, look at the, the possible future cash flows. Now the thing is that um, uh, people are rather sloppy about that. Mm -hmm. So they uh, simply assume something that they can uh, talk about for about two or three years, and then they extrapolate and uh, come up with uh, some linear growth uh, function which shows th uh, three to five percent growth every year. And if you have that, almost by default, you have a profitable investment. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, in the real options theory, we take that away. So we have to build foresight scenarios for the future cash flows. Mm -hmm. And we have to identify the situations where we can get these, uh, these um, uh, future revenues. Uh, this was done, uh, there, there's this uh, uh, Black Scholes famous theory about options pricing. Mm -hmm. They got mm -hmm. the Nobel Prize in economics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, what they do is they use stochastic processes. Mm -hmm. So everything f 15 years ahead is a stochastic process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is mathematically very nice, but uh, when we again talk about rigor and relevance, it's very rigorous. Uh, but uh, it's hard to defend as being relevant, hmm. that you can somehow describe the stochastic process uh, 15 years ahead. So um, what we did was that we took out the parameters, the Black and Scholes formula, replaced them with uh, uh, intervals, these intervals uh, have a distribution, a so-called possibility distribution, mm -hmm. and uh, they are called fuzzy numbers. Mm -hmm. And then we rework the whole model with that one. Mm -hmm. And that helps us to uh, include the uncertainty in the future cash flows 
into that model. How controversial was this? Very controversial. Okay. We had to fight our way through the real options community to get it published, and uh, that took some time. And but now it's uh, accepted. But the most uh, interesting thing was when we were uh, talking about this model with uh, real life managers. Mm -hmm. This was in the steel industry, where they were thinking about some some big investments. Mm -hmm. And they, they would not believe it. They wanted to have the classical net present value method and uh, use that one. And we explained to them that guys, now you're going to put in extrapolation 25 years ahead with linear assumptions, and that's not going to work. So uh, uh, they did not buy it. So at um, the end, I said, OK, guys, uh, this was a time when the um, exchange rate between the US dollar and the euro was in favor of the U.S. dollar, so it was something like, uh, like 1.15 euros per U.S. dollar, mm -hmm. and I told them that uh, now it looks like the exchange rate between the U.S. dollar and the euro will change, mm -hmm. and that uh, we will, the the euro will be worth more than the U.S. dollar, and in the steel industry, this is going to have very significant impact. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, if this is going to happen, would that mean that your your uh, classical models will not work? Mm -hmm. I said, sure. But then they say, but this will never happen. So I said, okay, let's make a bet, five beers. <laughs> this will happen within 12 months. And of course, I had some, some background information about the financial markets and, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, and it happened uh, not within exactly 12 months, but in 12 months and one week. Oh my goodness, so you had so two six they, packs. So then they <laughs> sent me an email that, okay, we are not going to send you the beer, <laughs> but we are, we are going to accept the real options model. Even better, even, even better. better. So um, I just have one more question for you. Yes, I just please. want to be respectful of your time. So when you're, this is for a message for young researchers out there. When you're challenging a widely held assumption and you get pushback, do you have any advice? Um, because it's not an easy, necessarily an easy path. <laughs> uh, I think the only advice that, uh, that we can give the young researchers is that uh, uh, you have to try, try, and try again. <laughs> uh, come up with more facts and uh, show your results one more time and the second time, and the third time, until eventually uh, people will understand that uh, the way you do the, these things are better than uh, the alternatives. Mm -hmm. And is that the approach you took? That's the, the way we have been operating. How many times did you have to submit your paper before it was accepted? Well, submitting papers uh, is one thing, For but uh, getting a solution accepted in industry, mm -hmm. it's a much tougher process. Mm. Uh, I think that uh, about, uh, okay, I think about three times is, is the maximum I've been submitting a paper. Okay. And then in terms of industry, how many, how many uh, years? Sometimes uh, we have been uh, spending like uh, uh, 18 months okay. showing, doing new, re uh, new iterations, mm -hmm. getting new results, uh, and then telling it again. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, like in the case with the five beers, we get through. <laughs> but you have to, to understand that uh, now what we do is, is not only mathematics, it's also people's business. Mm -hmm. They have to trust what you are doing, they have to trust your results, and you have to be able to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important lesson that we have learned.